Uh, great to have you all here this evening. This is an important occasion in many respects. It has been launched in Brisbane already, but we're doing the Sydney launch of this wonderful book called John Howard from the Pavilion. And it's a collection of newspaper columns written by John Howard, of course, our second longest serving Prime Minister. And it is also um, uh, edited by our inaugural John Howard Fellow, Andrew Blythe, who will be running the show this evening. We at CIS figured that if the leading centre-right and centre-left think tanks can have a Ronald Reagan fellow and a Margaret Thatcher fellow, then a leading centre-right think tank like CIS should have a John Howard fellowship. And so our inaugural fellow is, um, is Andrew. Now, the other thing to bear in mind is that this book is published by our friends in Brisbane called Connor Court. Uh, and they're very sound uh, publishers of a lot of sound classical liberal and centre-right publications and we want to support them. Now the book is dedicated, and I'm reading this, to all those who aspire to hold or influence political life. And I think that's true. I'd also say it should be dedicated to all those political, business, sporting, cultural figures who suffer a major setback who think that their careers are over. Because what this book shows is that you can be in the deepest political valley, but you can still rise to the highest political mountain if you apply yourself. And history is littered with some great political comeback fighters. You think of Winston Churchill, Charles de Gaulle, Richard Nixon, Bill Clinton, the comeback kid, Robert Menzies, Benjamin Netanyahu, Dr. Mahathir coming back as leader of Malaysia in his early 90s, um, Shinzo Abe, of course written off in 2007, came back fighting fit within a few years. Um, crikey, you could even argue Kevin Rudd and Malcolm Turnbull. Well, they were written off. Their political obituaries were written, but they came back. But no one demonstrates the power of a political comeback fighter then our guest this evening, John Howard. Now, as many of you no doubt know, John Howard was elected to Parliament in 1974. Within a few years, he became the Treasurer in the Federal Coalition Government of Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser. He was Treasurer for six years. Then in opposition, he was the Federal uh, Shadow Treasurer under the leadership of Andrew Peacock for two years. Then he became the leader of the Liberal Party from 1995, sorry, 1985 until 1989 and he was dumped by his colleagues. And the overwhelming conventional wisdom in the Canberra Press Club was that John Howard was finished. Your Paul Kellys, your Michelle Grattons, your Laurie Oakes, your Kerry O'Briens, your Andrew Ollies, you name it. They all said that John Howard was finished. That was the overwhelming conventional wisdom. And these were dark days for John Howard. And at the time, our mutual friend, Frank Devine, the editor of the Australian newspaper, he asked John Howard to write a series of articles for the Australian while he was on the back bench. And it was only a period of six or so months. And those op-eds that he wrote for the Australian's opinion page, which I had the great pleasure of editing uh, for the best part of a decade in the 2000s, they appear here today and they really help, as John Howard here says, I have reread all the pieces I composed more than 30 years ago. There is not, mo not much I would like to take back. So it stands the test of time. But the point here is that those op-eds, and we'll hear this tonight, help John Howard frame the bedrock and the stamina to make a political comeback. And so within a year, he became a front bencher again and then, lo and behold, he became the federal liberal leader by 1995. And by 1996, he won one of our nation's largest election landslides. And then stayed in power for 12 years. My colleague, Andrew, will make a few statements and then welcome John Howard. They'll have a conversation and then we'll open it up to the audience. Excellent. Please welcome Andrew Blythe. Friends, allow me to provide some background. The now defunct The Bulletin magazine, published on 20 December 1988, portrays an image on its cover of a stoic John Howard, alongside a headline crying out, 
Mr. 18%. Why on earth does this man bother? The Morgan Gallup poll reveals Howard's approval rating for better Prime Minister at 18%, compared with Bob Hawke's commanding lead of 69%. Hawke was proving himself a popular Prime Minister. Having won re-election, driving ambitious economic and social reform, and leading bicentenary celebrations earlier in the year. Hawke had an impenetrable lead. In defiance, John Howard continued to develop policies, meet community leaders, deliver speeches, and take the fight up to the Hawke government in Parliament. Howard's efforts were not to be rewarded. Having succeeded Peacock as Liberal leader in 1985, and having lost the 87 federal election, in part because of coalition disunity created by the notorious Joe for Canberra push, a small but determined cohort of Howard's colleagues believed his time was up. They organised against him. A political operator as sharp and attuned as Howard was caught by surprise. Tuesday, May 9, 1989, was a tumultuous day in John Howard's political career. He was politically executed as leader of the Liberal Party by rogue elements within the party room. Working in secret, a core group of members had assiduously cultivated enough votes over many months to force a leadership spill. Howard was caught off guard. Supporters of Andrew Peacock secured their man the top job. Winning at all costs had spread to the federal Liberal Party. Howard was rocked to his core. His parliamentary colleagues John Moore, Wilson Tuckey, Chris uh, Puplik, David Joel and Peter Shack were later to reveal their treachery in an ABC television Four Corners program titled True Believer 1989. The group of five were writ large boasting of their plotting and scheming. Howard described the surprise leadership coup as an act without honour and the prospects of him resurrecting his leadership in the future is akin to Lazarus with a triple bypass. <laughs> Faced with the choice of remaining as the member for Bennelong or returning to the law, Howard turned to his family and friends for counsel. He was to be 50 in July, young enough to make a career as a lawyer and provide for his family. After much reflection, and time spent away from the political fray, Howard chose to stay and fight for the beliefs he valued. An active participant in the contest of ideas, Howard set about writing a weekly column for The Australian from June to November 1989. No topic was spared. Howard penned over two dozen articles ranging from the economy, industrial relations, foreign affairs, to sport, drugs, and organised crime. His articles were candid, engaging and topical. His anecdotes resonated with readers. Howard relished the chance to share his views with a wider audience, free of political constraints. He was to publish his 23rd and valedictory column ahead of his return to the Shadow Cabinet. Howard's time in the political wilderness allowed him to reflect and refine his political beliefs much like Menzies, and position himself to return as leader of the Federal Liberal Party in January 1995. Howard would secure a record majority of seats at the next federal election and go on to become Australia's 25th and second longest serving Prime Minister. His articles are a time capsule of evolving national and world events as the sun set on the 1980s. Presenting readers with a variety of topical issues, Howard's columns are laced with political insights and anecdotes revealing his craft for engaging commentary. Offering readers a window into his beliefs and drive for political reform, Howard delves into economic uncertainty caused by high interest rates, increasing national debt and rising unemployment, as well as assessments on unfolding events in Eastern Europe apartheid in South Africa, unrest in China, and the rise of Japan. We're also reminded of his passion for sport, 
namely cricket and his admiration for Australian Test cricket captain Alan Border. Howard moved seamlessly across economic, political and social affairs with enthusiasm and composure, offering policy prescriptions that he, as Lazarus with a triple bypass, would later adopt in shaping the ascent to power on March 2, 1996. Mr Howard, welcome. Thank you for being with us tonight at the Centre for Independent Studies for the Sydney launch. Before we get into the nitty gritty of your columns, perhaps you can share with us your thoughts on a recent event that sent shockwaves through Australia and the United Kingdom. Fox Sports reports that Nathan Lyon has revealed that England wicketkeeper Johnny Bairstow confronted the Australians in the players' lunchroom following his controversial dismissal. Was Alex Carey right <laughs> in stumping Bairstow? And what was the chatter in the members' section? <laughs> well, <clears throat> one of the kind things that um, the British establishment did, and I include the MCC in that phrase, uh, did to me was to make me an honorary life member of the MCC. There's only one other Australian that's been given that honour, and that was Robert Gordon Menzies. I've got to tell you, when it comes to choosing between England and Australia, the Scots always barrack for Australia. <laughs> <coughs> I was staying at the Caledonian Club uh, with Jeanette uh, on her most recent visit, so um, it wasn't hard to pick up their uh, bias in those matters. But um, look, I, <coughs> I thought it was typical ashes. Uh, <laughs> hard ball, I mean, I, I, I thought it was, um, I mean, he was technically out, of course he was. Uh, whether it was within the rules of the spirit of cricket, I, I don't know. I was asked, what does the spirit of cricket mean? I said, it means different things to different people, depending on the circumstances. <laughs> and that was basically what it... But I've got to tell you, it was terrific cricket. It has done so much for orthodox Ashes cricket. <clears throat> Those who follow the, that glorious game very closely will know that only once in the history of the Ashes has a team that has won the first two matches in a five-match series not gone on to win the whole series, and that was Gubby Allen's touring Englishman in 1936-37 when they were um, trying to redeem their honour after the disgraceful bodyline series. Now, I'm not the least bit biased in these matters, <laughs> but, but uh, I just wanted to make that gentle point. Um, <laughs> but... Um, it was, it, it's been a great series and, I mean, much and all as I enjoy your company and all your wonderful friends, I'm, Jeanette and I wish we were back in Manchester <laughs> 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 to, um, uh, it has really been a wonderful series and um, who, who was right? No, I, I, I don't know. I don't really want to get into that. I, you know, the, the, the media, <coughs> both English and Australian, said, you know, what's your view? Uh, uh, and, and they wanted me to have an argument with Rishi Sunak. I, I left that to Anthony Albanese. He knows far more about cricket than I do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but the great thing is that it's terrific cricket. And I have to say in all seriousness that um, Jeanette and I have been privileged to see two of the great Ben Stokes innings. We were at Leeds in Headingley in four years ago when uh, he, he pulled that game off and uh, that was terrific and he, and he had a great innings in, at Lords. My theory is that if um, the Bearstow incident had not occurred, Stokes would not have got as worked up and he wouldn't have batted as well. I think that's very even handed, isn't it? I don't know. <laughs> um, but um, I think we'll win one of the remaining two games or at the very, very least get a draw and we'll We'll keep uh, the urn, but um, it's a terrific game. And the, the atmosphere at, the, uh, at um, Headingley was quite remarkable because Headingley's in the north of England. And if you follow, as I do, a little bit of rugby league um, and, and you, you, you drive up there and you see all these wonderful names like Wakefield Trinity and Bull, and <laughs> you realise that Rugby league is a contest between Yorkshire and Lancashire versus New South Wales and Queensland. 
It can't romance itself in being a contest between England and Australia. But um, <coughs> great series, and I just say to Manchester, I wish I was there. <laughs> and, and perhaps just quickly, continuing your love of sport, mm. Dan Andrews, Oh, the don't get games. me started. I don't. <laughs> All right. I mean, that bloke is outrageous. I mean, really is. As if they didn't know. And, and, and can I say, <clears throat> I mean, it's very seriously, events like the Commonwealth Games particularly and Olympic Games more generally are events where <clears throat> the opportunity for many local community sports, which are supported by volunteers, where the people who come through that sporting stream of, uh, to shine and the heartbreak a lot of them will feel of, of not being able to represent their country and particularly their local area. You know, and it's a great, I mean, you, you've, you've got to have known. Come on, I mean, I've been through all of this. I mean, gee, how do you, I mean, it, it really brings a level of, of, of sort of national embarrassment it's not Victoria or New South Wales. I don't really care for state loyalties. I never have. But it's, it's, it's a national embarrassment that this has happened. And, uh, you know, I, I, I feel we're, we're a lesser country that this has happened. My view. Thank you. Before we jump back, mm. let's take a further step back. And you're in your final year at Canterbury Boys High. Yes, good but school. Mm. The school that produced one of Australia's greatest cricketers, Arthur Morris. Arthur Morris uh, was captain of uh, Canterbury Boys High in the late 1930s, and he was one of the great opening batsmen we had. He very, very, and also, if you want to continue talking about rugby league, George Paponis was a, uh, a graduate of uh, Canterbury Boys High School. But something significant happened that yeah, year. Yeah, my father died at the beginning of my last year at school. Dad was 59. He had a short life, but he'd been one of those people that had fought. He was a World War I digger, and um, he'd been gassed on the Western Front and never fully recovered from that. But um, he met <laughs> mum and had together they had four sons, and I was the last. So he uh, made a huge contribution, but he was a great... Um, inspiration to me. He was a, the classic, hard-working, committed small businessman, which is a very large kidney of the Liberal Party, that small business tradition. And um, I mean, there are political parties have sort of have a variety of kidneys, don't they? But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you're, you're only 16. Yeah, I was 16. And, and that's but, you know, a lot of people you know, have more difficult circumstances. But I was lucky I had very devoted mother and uh, three older brothers, um, and they were great, and I was close to them in different ways. Uh, one of them doesn't share my politics; he's the one survivor, Bob. But he's, uh, um, you know, we're good fr we're friends. We we gave up arguing years ago. Um, <laughs> it's no point. Um, I remember when the Republican referendum was on. My oldest brother, Wall, who died at the age of 93, he and I were sort of just straight down the line. You know, death to all roundheads. So, <laughs> that's what I was really concerned. Stan said, I said to him after the vote, I said, how do you vote, Stan? He said, oh, I voted no. I said, well, that's good to hear. And uh, I said, what, you know, finally sealed it all. He said, oh, Carrie, that was his lovely wife, uh, still with us. Um, said, Carrie and I were watching television one night and Goff and Malcolm came on together and said, it's time. He said that was enough for me, he said, I decided it wasn't. <laughs> he had a great sense of humour, Stan. And, um, yeah, so I was fortunate having a family uh, like that and uh, I hope in different ways uh, I've sort of got that family solidarity in the generation. One of my wonderful children, Richard, is here tonight. Can I just say that the other person I particularly want to mention tonight presence is Michael Aaron Freud Bone. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Michael, as many of you know, was the member for MacArthur, uh, a talented financial journalist, <coughs> Consul General for Australia in New York, 
And he once said to me that he was the only <coughs> known example of a Masonic Jewish uh, Catholic uh, Presbyterian uh, some in captivity. <coughs> he did it very, very well. But um, he was a, been a wonderful friend and a great raconteur and um, a, a person who was suited in so many ways to be the Consul General in that great city of New York. So <coughs> you're dealing with the death of your father, mm. but you still managed to complete your studies. Oh yeah, I, and I, I liked uh, history. Yeah. I, was, I liked history. One of the interesting things I recollect about that period is that there was a lot of talk when we got into this sort of uh, culture, historical debate, and uh, my um, uh, 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 respected adversary, Paul Keating, and I used to clash occasionally on uh, the Anglo-Australian connection. And um, um, th I had a, there was only one textbook on, that you studied for the leaving certificate then, it was called The History of Modern Europe. And it was written by S.H. Roberts, Stephen Roberts, who was the Vice Chancellor of Sydney University. and. In retrospect, people said, oh, the problem with the teaching of history then was that they were all English uh, historians. They went. And I mean, I, I remember uh, Roberts wrote the standard text on, on, on uh, modern history, as said was. Doesn't seem so modern now. But, um, and um, we had a fellow called Frank Driscoll who wrote a book on um, Australian history, and he taught his own book. And, uh, and the other was Dr. H.C. Curry, who wrote a <coughs> wonderful book on, he wrote the book on, on, on British history. But they're all Australian authors, that's the point I'm making. And this nonsense that you know, we, we only ever read texts that have been written by Englishmen or Americans, it's all, it's all nonsense. But, and you're asked to nominate three occupations in your final year. Yes. One of, that, one of those was solicitor. Well, one of those would be a lawyer, lawyer. What um, the other two? A, a, a detective, yep. <laughs> you believe a detective, yep. and uh, a journalist. And of course, the other thing is that I never saw politics as a first occupation. And that leads me into uh, something I feel very strongly about modern politics, that we've got too many people who end up in Parliament having had no life's experience in any other occupation. I get lots of um, young men and women coming to me and saying, oh, I'm interested in politics and you know, you got any advice? And I say, well, yes, don't let the Pakistani army talk you into bowling in Kashmir. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first piece of advice I've got. I said, the second piece of advice is that <clears throat> you should get a job in something, you know, whatever it is, be a school teacher, public servant, a lawyer, a doctor, whatever it is, and, and spend a decade or so doing that before you want to go into parliament. But I think this increasing pattern where, and I hope I don't insult anybody in the audience, and I don't mean to insult them, but you, you go to school, you go to university, you get a, and, and then uh, if you're in the Labor Party, you um, go to a union office, then on to a member's staff, and then you seek pre-selection. Now that's fine, and it's produced some great people. But it's also produced people who see politics as a game rather than as something involved in achieving good outcomes. And I think it's one of the reasons why we've had so much turmoil and so many turnovers of leadership in Australian politics and in British politics. I've just come back from Britain and I ran out of days to meet former Prime Ministers. <laughs> 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 In, in 1980, May of 1989, mm. what do you recall of the event, the event surrounding the challenge to your leadership? Did you have a sense something wasn't right? Oh, look, I knew I was struggling <laughs> with the public. I don't think that's right when you're trying to become Prime Minister. <clears throat> and um, look, the truth is that, yeah, sure, I was overthrown by a secret coup and all, but that happens in politics. And I guess when you ultimately end up becoming Prime Minister, and you've held the office for 12 years, you mellow a bit in your assessment of what people did. <coughs> I, when I became Prime Minister, I 
included in my first ministry several of the people who'd organised against me. That was the only sensible thing to do. I, I had a discussion with John Major, who I'm very fond of and he loves cricket. And, he's, uh, and I said to him, why was the antagonism between you and Margaret Thatcher so strong? And he said, she, he said, well, there's a couple of reasons. He said, and one of them was that she resented the fact that I included Michael Heseltine in my ministry. And Heseltine, of course, was the minister who stood against Thatcher and triggered the events that led to her removal. And you know, I said, well, I could understand that, but he said, I had no alternative. He said, he was a significant figure. And, and you've, you've always got to mix realism and emotion when it comes to those things. And, um, and in any event, I thought somebody like John Moore, who had good business experience, understood um, uh, the corporate world very well, was a prominent liberal from Queensland. And I've got to say, when it comes to areas of Australia, I won't have a word said against the Queenslanders. Right. Queensland was my best state. Uh, <laughs> I've got, <laughs> I, I got to tell you that um, um, not long before the 1996 election, I was rung by that legendary dual international Rex Mossop, who, who came from the Manly Moringa area, and Rex sort of believed in the knock them over and kick them sort of down when they're down theory of, of both codes of rugby. And uh, he said, John, I got the solution. I know how you can win. I said, oh, yes, Rex. I mean, he was, a, he was very sound uh, in, in his political views. And I said, well, what is that, Rex? He said, he said, what you've got to do, he says, this was when the war between Super League and the NRL, or something like that, was raging. So what you've got to do, John, he said, you've got to come out in favour of um, uh, uh, Quayle and Arthurson, you know, it's the NRL, and forget about those Super League players. I said, yes, Rex, he said, I said, what about those sort of, you know, a few areas of the, of, 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 of the place that support the Super League? I said, what about, you know, the Broncos? You know, he said, John, let me give you, I said, forget about Queensland, he said. He said, all you've got to do is come out there. And I said, well, thanks, Rex, I take it. <coughs> was in, we then went on to win the record two-party preferred vote in Queensland a few months later. But I was very grateful for Rex's uh, intervention. <laughs> <laughs> So, so Frank Devine. Oh, wonderful man, Frank. And his daughter Miranda provides no, some she's a great very girl. generous words. The and, Divine and Miranda, they called her. Yes. So he <laughs> agrees to pay you $800 an article. Was that good? Well, it's $2,052 in today's money. That's not right. That's good. So... Is that good? Is, is, that a, is that the voice of a journo, is it? Yeah. <laughs> a, a straggling, <laughs> battling journo. Is it? So I'm sure Mrs. Howard must have been chuffed with that little earner yeah, for the mortgage. I, but I don't know whether she understood the exchange rate. I don't think I did. I did. I mean, it was as good as that. Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> it's good. Yeah, you did all right. Yeah. And you, so you once shared with me that you wrote Lazarus Rising in longhand. How did you go about developing your columns? Was there a theme that you settled on? Oh yeah, look, I, I, I settled on a theme and I tried to vary them. <coughs> um, and I've reread all of them in the last um, few weeks. And uh, I, I don't think there is a one I'm more proud of than the one I wrote about Alan Border, because that was on top of the, following the, uh, uh, the victory at Old Trafford, which uh, clinched the series for us in 1989. And interestingly enough, <laughs> I, I start the column by um, uh, that refrain of Simon and Garfunkel. And they say, um, where, uh, Joe DiMaggio, where have you gone? And I likened uh, uh, Alan Border, sort of the lament in, of Simon and Garfunkel about uh, um, Joe DiMaggio, who uh, I think was what, the second or third? Mr. Marilyn Monroe, yeah. Oh. Yes, he did. He did marry Marilyn Monroe. Yes, he did. I, right. I'm sure of that. Okay. <laughs> I'm and say she and I'm sure that. your <laughs> you know, your thoughts as well as ours are with Alan with Well Alan <laughs> he's a wonderful man and um, he's a he's true grit 
and um, terrific fellow. And uh, he's uh, very courageous and open uh, mm. uh, reference um, to uh, his, his health issues mm. and uh, be a great fellow. Terrific captain. So world events, we're in the final six months of the 1980s. Yeah. A new decade beckons. Mm. Can you recall some of the events from that time? Oh, well, very vividly. I mean, the, the, the greatest event was um, undoubtedly the collapse of the Soviet Union. And uh, it's, it was the most transformative world event in my lifetime. I and mean, bear in mind that, well, I, was, I mean, I was pretty, well, I was born in July of 1939. Um, but of course, in terms of consciousness of politics, uh, you've, uh, you've got to fast forward a bit to the end of World War II. And, and of course, well, the years following World War II were defined by the Cold War and the rise of Soviet Union and uh, uh, having rolled the Germans out of Eastern Europe, they never vacated the space. And uh, NATO was full of them. And I just find this debate about NATO in the present time just extraordinary because um, I mean NATO was formed to <coughs> deal with the threat of the Soviet Union. It was really conceived um, in, un in the shadow of uh, the policy of containment which was first articulated in an intellectual way by George Kennan's famous long telegram from about the power of the Soviet Union and uh, it was an interesting, I mean, I, I find the leadership of NATO at the present time a bit disappointing. Um, I think this veto that Joe Biden has imposed on, on uh, the British Defence Secretary is, is extraordinary, and extraordinarily inept. Uh, I mean, heaven above, I thought the Anglo-Irish Treaty was signed 100 years ago. I mean, I, <laughs> I mean we just got to sort of uh, get on with... Uh, Live and I, I'm, I'm disappointed in that. But um, look, NATO was a Western response to Soviet imperialism. What will happen to the Russian Empire? And Putin is not an orthodox communist. He's just an orthodox dictator, which comes in a long line from the Tsars through. And uh, I don't know what will happen in Russia. I can speculate as well as anybody else, but. Uh, I think um, uh, <coughs> there is a certain fragility in his position, let me put it that way, and I wouldn't be surprised if uh, um, he's in a less secure position in a year's time. So just if we stay with NATO just for a minute, mm. obviously there is Paul Keating's reference to Stoltenberg being a supreme fool. Uh, we've got Emmanuel, Emmanuel Macron opposing the establishment of a liaison office in Tokyo. And on the other hand, UK Defence Secretary Ben Wallace has cautioned against NATO expanding its role into the Pacific, <coughs> uh, highlighting the risk of mission creep. Are they all right? Or uh, By definition, no. Um, <laughs> but depending on the circumstances they unravel, perhaps they, they are all right in different ways and at different times. NATO is primarily what the acronym suggests, the North Atlantic Treaty Organisation, and it was formed, interestingly enough, as much at the, the initiative of a British Labor Foreign Secretary, uh, Ernie Bevin, not to be confused with an Iron Bevan, um, because uh, he understood in a way that the British Labor Party at that time did better than the Australian Labor Party, the threat uh, of communism in Europe. It was formed to resist Soviet Union. It was right and it's been successful. And um, <clears throat> if it hadn't been for NATO, then I think the situation in Europe would have deteriorated even worse for the West. But in the end, um, the Soviet Union was brought down by uh, the uh, combined efforts of uh, uh, those three people who were the subject of a book by John O'Sullivan called The Pope, the Prime Minister and the President, which was about Pope John Paul II, who was probably the dominant, most influential religious leader of the post-World War II period, in my view. He's a remarkable man. He's one of the really 
great experiences of my time as Prime Minister to meet him. And uh, of course, um, Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan. And it was said of the three of them in that wonderful book that John O'Sullivan wrote, he said that um, um, at one time they were all out of favour. Um, Pope John Paul II was regarded as, would you believe, too Catholic. Um, and uh, uh, um, <coughs> Margaret Thatcher was uh, regarded as too conservative. And Ronald Reagan was <laughs> regarded as too, Ameri too patriotic, too American. Uh, in the end, none of them changed their spots and they helped bring about a big change in the world. And, and you also addressed the issue of apartheid in South yes, Africa. Yes, I did. I, I was a bit, um, uh, in the eyes of some people, a bit of a laggard on that. I wasn't, I, I have to confess that my great concern was that... Um, if the transition to a democratic South Africa was not handled correctly, that you could have a lot of bloodshed. Um, it was a pretty grim place. And um, I mean, I had absolutely no patience, uh, and neither should anybody who believes in individual liberty have any patience for uh, the dominant uh, white minority rule. It was a dictatorship. But I also think you have to give credit uh, to um, uh, F.W. de Klerk as well as credit to Nelson Mandela. I mean, Mandela was a great figure and it was impossible not to feel uh, you were in the presence of somebody really special. I think his capacity to forgive uh, his oppressors and his jailers and exhibit a level of Christian charity towards them was quite remarkable. But I think also... F.W. de Klerk did the hardest thing you have to do in politics if you're forced to do it, that is tell your own strongest supporters that they've got to give up their privileged position. And that's what he did. Because without de Klerk saying to the dominant Afrikaners in South Africa, the game is up, you could have had real bloodshed. Anyway. And, and you had a warm relationship with um, the co-leader of the Democratic Party. Dr. Dennis Worrell. Oh yeah, D Dennis Worrell was a, uh, as the name suggests, he was an Anglo-South African, but he was, he was um, Democratic Party, really he was part of the, what you might loosely call the liberal stream of, of white South Africans. And of course, I mean, all of this is, is, is to most people now ancient history, but it wasn't then. It was uh, very strong. And my principal political rival in Australia, of course, at the time, Bob Hall, who I developed a very good relationship with years later, uh, he would remind us frequently that, of course, he was the reason why uh, everything was you know, fixed up in South Africa. But anyway. Well, and as you just touched, touched on, um, you delve into the, the economic transformations taking place, especially in Eastern Europe, as the decade um, drew to a close. Recently, Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor mm. in the Biden administration, delivered a speech suggesting that neoliberalism is losing its prominence. Mm. I thought that... Sorry. No, no, that's exactly... What's your perspective? Well, I, I, I thought that was both significant and disturbing um, because I'm very strongly of the view that if um, the policy pursued of a military build-up backed by the economic cloud of the United States, had not been implemented by Reagan and particularly his Defence Secretary Weinberger, uh, that the Soviet Union would not have collapsed. Now, a lot of people disagree with that, and there's an endless debate about whether uh, Gorbachev deserves more credit uh, or was it the impact of the Reagan-Weinberger military build-up, which forced the Russians to try and match it, which you know, fractured their economy, you can debate that forever, and, and I give a lot of credit to Gorbachev. Uh, he he, he uh, understood the, that internal reform was necessary. But you can't again say the fact that um, the impact of that military build-up confronted the Soviet Union with the reality that her economy was just beyond it. And uh, it, I mean, I'm old enough to remember a lot of people arguing um, uh, a moral equivalence between the Soviet Union and 
and, and the United States. I remember when, when Reagan died, the, uh, that esteemed newspaper, The Australian, invited me to write an op-ed piece on, uh, uh, it's not in this book, it was later on, and uh, an op-ed piece about uh, the impact of Reagan. And um, <coughs> I can recall all sorts of people when Reagan said to Gorbachev, tear down this wall when he was in Berlin, he made that speech. People saying, well, shuffling their feet and saying, well, you mustn't say that, you know. And really, it's extraordinary. But that was the mood of the times. But um, he was a, Reagan was a fascinating person. You know, that memorable comment he made at his inauguration where he says, government is not the solution, government's the problem. And uh, it encapsulated so much of the core ethos of the centre right of politics. And it's something that we've got to, we of the centre right, and you know, people can choose to identify with that or not, that's their business, but we've really got to identify with it, I do. And we've got to understand that you've, you've got to have a core message. And I don't think we do that as well now as we might. Well, I'm, well, I'm glad you brought that up because the American psychologist and author, Dr. Jean Twang, in her latest book, Generations, she has shed, shedding, sheds light on an intriguing observation, and it's today's young Republicans perceive a greater role for government compared to previous generations. Reagan must be turning in his grave. Well, I think even people uh, um, less dedicated than Reagan might be spitting a little too. I think you ask, and... and I, I find the Trump era in American and Republican politics deeply disturbing. Uh, I, I mean, I am no fan of the former president. I thought he, he did a number of good things. I think he did better in the Middle East uh, than uh, any, any of his um, contemporaries. And uh, I thought he was right when he retaliated when the Syrians crossed the red line and he probably did a few good things economically, but his refusal to accept the umpire's decision. When you're given out and you go to the review system and you're still given out, you leave the field. Uh, you don't muck around and pretend that it's all a travesty, and I think that's what he did. I think he's unfit because of that to ever be president again. He could end up being, I think. I think it's a very uneasy choice. If, um, because I think the current incumbent is, well, sometimes fluffs his lines, and that can happen. And I don't, I don't miss him in any well, but I mean, his comments about Northern Ireland, I mean, for heaven's sake, that's years ago. I mean, get over it. So let's now move to your relationship with George W. Bush. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and he bestowed on, on you the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2009, in recognition of your unwavering support in combating terrorism. Can it be inferred that the close association that you had contributed to the recent formation of AUKUS? Oh, I, think it, I think it helped, but it's, it, I mean, you've got to remember that the, the relationship between America and Australia it transcends party politics. In, in my opinion, the most unpopular pro-American decision taken by Australia was to join uh, America in the war in Vietnam. I mean, the, the, the Vietnamese war had a, an enormous impact on our country, but it had an infinitely greater one on the United States. And that was um, a decision of the centre-right Menzies of the centre-left Johnson, or centre-left Kennedy, to start with. It was really Kennedy who irretrievably committed. Um, uh, people don't like acknowledging it. But uh, he, when Kennedy was assassinated, there were 16,000 American advisers in Vietnam. And that's a lot. And um, it, it, it was interesting that Johnson and uh, Humphrey were very close to Holt and Menzies before them. Um, and I think that relationship has um, endured and I think Bush and I carried that forward. We were 
broadly of the same stripe politically, but it wouldn't have, it would, I don't think that in the end would have mattered too much, but I think we did make a contribution, but let's not diminish the contribution that Scott Morrison made. I mean, he's, you know, he, he gets kicked around a lot now and he's criticised a lot, but the, that sort of came a bit from nowhere, that uh, arrangement he, 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 he devised, and uh, I think he deserves a lot of credit and uh, I'm happy to give it to him. And given the significance of this new security agreement, mm. are you confident that Australia can live up to its side? Of the <coughs> well, I, I, I am, and, and I have no argument with the way in which the current Labor government has handled it. I think they've handled that part of their um, responsibilities very well. And what I wanted to just focus on now is that during your time as Prime Minister, Australia witnessed notable stability. Mm. With Alexander Downer serving as Foreign Minister, Peter Costello as Treasurer for the 11 and a half years. Other countries experienced more significant changes. Let me give you some examples. Japan had six different Prime Ministers, 11 Foreign Ministers and eight Finance Ministers. The UK had three Prime Ministers, five Foreign Secretaries, three Chancellors of the Exchequer. The US saw two Presidents, four Secretaries of State and seven Treasury Secretaries. Is there something to be said of stability and the ability to navigate complex policy oh, oh, solutions? There is, there is. There's no doubt that the only time in our uh, post-1901 history when you had the same people occupying the three most important positions, Prime Minister, Treasurer and Foreign Minister, was myself and Alexander Downer and Peter Costello. And there's no doubt that the success of the government that I was privileged to lead owed a lot to those, uh, those two men and, and, and to others. And Peter Ruth was uh, the great all-rounder. Uh, and, and, and Philip Ruddock did it. Splendid. And the partnership with the Nationals. I'd, I never met a more decent person in public life than John Anderson. He was great. Per and Tim Fisher and... And without those two, uh, it would have been much harder to have navigated the gun control uh, measures which were so important early in my government. But stability is very important. Now, why it's been <coughs> less stable is, I think it's got something to do with um, the fact that we um, are a less joining generation than was the case earlier. One of the most important books I read on this subject was called Bowling Alone by an American sociologist uh, um, who discovered through analysis that um, people no longer went to bowling alleys in groups that went personally. And how he discovered this was that he examined beer and pizza sales and he, and he found that they'd all... And what has really happened, and this is a and this is still in very relevant, is that people don't join organisations the way they used to. And this has affected political parties, it's affected churches, it's affected unions. Uh, and it's not going to change. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not sort of saying it's a temporary phenomenon, but you've got to, and it, and it has an impact on political parties. And it makes political parties more prone to how shall I put it, take over uh, uh, by factions. And um, I think you get very perverse outcomes. And of course, it, it does highlight, if I may sound a bit partisan for a moment, the absurdity that at a time when trade union membership in this country is lower than it's been in the lifetime of anybody in this room, yet the dominance of trade unions in the deliberative councils of the governing party is uh, out of all proportion to its membership. I'll rest my case on that. Just, you may not remember, but your <coughs> last article, do you remember who actually appears next to you in a, with an opinion piece? <laughs> no, no, Margaret no. Thatcher. Well, I'm on it. There you go. What was your relationship like with the IMF? Oh, look, look I, Margaret Thatcher was <coughs> never Prime Minister while I was Prime Minister, um, but she was a very helpful um, 
leader of our side of politics in the broad terms. Um, I met her when I paid a visit to Britain in, when she was Prime Minister. And I'm, I'm, I've never forgotten a, a great gesture by Doug McClelland, who is the, along with Bill Hayden, is the, the only two survivors of the Whitlam regime. And Bill, uh, I, uh, I'm sorry, Doug, who was a great supporter of the St George uh, rugby league team, as I am, he was High Commissioner when I visited Britain. And uh, he came out to meet me at the airport and he said, mate, he says, I've only done this one other time. He said, I did it for Hawk and I'll do it for you. Um, uh, you as far as I'm concerned, you, he's the Prime Minister and you're the alternative Prime Minister. And we went through my program and most of the meetings I had lined up, he was coming along and because it was an opportunity for him to talk to some of the people I was meeting. And he, he, he lighted on uh, the meeting I was having with Margaret Thatcher and his name was on the list and he said, mate, he said, I'm not going to come to that. He said, you two will want to bag the Labor Party. And he said, <laughs> and, 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 and he said I don't want to tramp your style. <laughs> and, and of course, he, he, he was true to his word. He was a, he was a good bloke, Doug. And uh, well, and his son uh, was, uh, of course, the Attorney General in, uh, and, and now the Chief Justice, I think the family court. Oh, yeah. hmm. Um, yeah, look, I, I, she was extraordinary. What can undeniably be said about Margaret Thatcher is that she turned her country around. She took on the unit. She's, she was very solicitous towards Australia. She visited Australia three times as Prime Minister and she came to Australia just after she was elected. She went to a meeting of the G7 in Japan and said she wanted to come and talk to Malcolm Fraser uh, about an upcoming Commonwealth conference in Lusaka to, as she put it, to solve this Rhodesia business. And, and of course, she and Malcolm didn't really um, agree on this Rhodesia business. As far as he was concerned, it was this Zimbabwe uh, business. It was still Rhodesia to her. But she um, copped a lot of criticism uh, from the more progressive side of the Conservative Party in relation to colonial affairs. But the um, truth is she, her defeat of the unions in the coal miners' strike and, and also the uh, interest of a number of people in this room, the way she altered industrial relations in uh, the print, in the newspaper industry was quite, a, quite remarkable and of course um, she uh, was very close to, um, um, didn't always agree with Rupert Murdoch, but his newspapers uh, were very supportive of her. And rightly so, in my opinion. Um, before my closing remarks, perhaps mm. a couple of questions from the audience, if anyone would like to put their hand up. For the yeah. gentleman there. Just wait for Thank the you. microphone there. There we go. Just uh, can you look forward into the future and see what uh, is, is going to happen in, in terms of political scenarios and how we're going? You got any thoughts on that? Well, domestically, um, <coughs> any government of any stripe being in power at the present time is it's not easy. There are a lot of um, economic headwinds. I don't think it's all due to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I think that's a bit of a stretch. Um, in my opinion, the voice will be defeated. I think the voice is um, uh, taking water. The problem with the voice is that nobody quite understands what it's about. And, and I mean, a lot of people are saying to me, why are we doing it? You know, I, I, nobody can argue with the desirability of, of some kind of preambular recognition that the Indigenous people were the first here. Of course, that's self-evidently true. But um, as I understand it, the argument of those who want a yes vote uh, is that having a voice will plug the gaps and 
solve a lot of the problems that we can't solve, but nobody quite has explained to me how that will happen. I mean, I think of my experience with the Northern Territory intervention. Nothing much has changed in the Northern Territory in 15 years. How is the voice going to be different? Now, it's tempting for people to say, well, because nothing has changed in 15 years, that's the reason why you should have the voice. But I think they've got an obligation to go further and say, how is it the voice is going to alter things? And it is undoubtedly based on race. And, and I think that's an undesirable thing. Um, so I think it will lose. It's very hard to get a referendum carried in <laughs> this country. I mean, you need a double majority. And that's hard. Um, I remember, I do remember the referendum as Bone would too, uh, the referendum to ban the Communist Party. I think Bone will remember it because it was an occasion for the Liberal Party to expel him or something. Like <laughs> because he, he actually voted no. Uh, as I've, I've often recorded, there was one occasion I can remember my parents voted differently. <laughs> they were staunch. Um, and was so mum. Hmm? Your mum. My mum uh, said, I'm not going to vote for that. That means he wants too much power. That was the end of the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Another question. Yes, please. Thank you, Max. John, what do you believe might happen in the US elections next year and what do you think the foreign policy implications? I, I'm sorry, say it again. Close, yeah. What do you think might happen in the US elections next year and what would the foreign policy implications of a Trump win be? Well, I think um, that um, there's a strong likelihood that Trump will be the Republican candidate again. I hope he's not. Um, I think it's almost um, you know, a given that um, some people like Pompeo have dropped out because a combination of not being able to get enough money because people think Trump's going to get the nomination and the fear on the part of people like Pompeo that he will get the nomination caused him to drop out. I think that's a shame. I think DeSantis is good. But the Republican Party's still got a very strong isolationist streak. I mean, it's just amazing to me after, after the experience of World War II, and if there's still lots of Lindberghs in, in um, the Republican Party, which I think is very disturbing. And, I mean, it wasn't the, the view of, the, of either of the Bushes. They were both very um, uh, internationalist. And it's not in the interests of the world for America to retreat to isolation. Do I think, um, <clears throat> I mean, Biden, he, he, there was a, I think I used the word fragility. And I, I don't think the leader of the free world should be fragile. And it doesn't matter what his or her uh, politics may be. And I think back to what, 2012, you had a contest between Barack Obama and Mitt Romney. Now, that was a, a good quality contest. Now, yeah, a lot of people didn't like Obama, a lot of people did. I mean, he was certainly, uh, it was an historic thing to have a black American president. I mean, wonderful thing. It must have transformed the attitude of a lot of Americans, both black and white. And Romney had had a very, great, you know, very successful business career. In your reflective mood, I want to ask you about Paul Keating. But, but first, of, but first of all, can I remind you, when you keep on uh, referring to your cricket prowess in Pakistan, that, that in fact, the press gallery claims that the only reason I was appointed parliamentary secretary to you as treasurer was because I stumped the bloke off your bowling oh. in one of our Canberra cricket matches. <laughs> uh, and you, you also played for your school uh, at cricket, so that uh, you're not simply a, uh, a, a Pakistani-style uh, bowler, <laughs> if I can <laughs> defend you. Uh, my question about Keating <laughs> is that he is, uh, he claims to have initiated economic reform rather than having simply implemented your reforms. 
uh, and most of the uh, books about him do admit that he opposed in the early stages freeing the uh, currency. Uh, I wondered to what extent your views of Keating are that the word initiating is uh, a Keatingism, in other words, is absolute baloney. <laughs> uh, it reminds me of when I was in England recently, I, and in the wake of the, you know, the Bear Stow incident, I was asked uh, by some journalists that how did I, you know, what did I think the expression spirit of cricket meant? And I said, spirit of cricket meant different things to different people. And uh, I think we, we saw that on that case. Um, Paul Keating was a very successful political pugilist. Mm. His combination with Hawke was very effective. Um, it is true that um, uh, he was not entirely consistent on certain fundamental economic reforms. I think the most glaring inconsistency was his attitude of, uh, on, on really the consumption tax. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he did promote uh, option C, a tax uh, summit, and his strongest supporter on that was me. Uh, and I got into a lot of strife with some of my colleagues for doing it. But then he, of course, turned around and ran that very effective political campaign in 1993. And our uh, mutual friend John was not, Houston was not really up to uh, dealing with him. But and he's made a contribution, a big contribution. And I suppose I've reached that stage in life where there's no, I mean, no point in sort of cheese pairing about people who've had an impact on the other side. I think Hawke was a, a superior leader in every way. Hawke, in my view, is the best Labor Prime Minister this country's had. Uh, he certainly, and I don't think... Ever been the curtain? Yes. Well, that's just my view. I mean, Tom, I mean, uh, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> and look, it, I mean, it depends what you measure. Um, uh, ability and, and, and greatness by, but, but Hawke um, was able to assimilate the various strains that exist within the Labor Party and he had a capacity to relate <coughs> to the Australian public and uh, I, mean, I don't want to overdo it but you ask me a question I'll give you an answer and uh, I, I think he was a um, curtain was yeah he was good but I think Hawke was even better. Mr Howard, Paul Kelly remarked for the book, that the country has lost a, a columnist but gained a Prime Minister, mm. while Troy Bramston describes you as an embodiment of resilience, determination and ambition. Before I hand back to Tom for a vote of thanks, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to you for not being in Manchester. <laughs> uh, I would also um, like to extend my heartfelt thanks to Tom and the entire team at CIS for making this evening possible. And I also express my appreciation to Anthony Capello from Connor Court for agreeing to publish the book. And finally, to all of you for being here and for buying a copy of the book, because Mr Howard will be very happy to sign it for you. And happy birthday for next week. Thank you. I just want to say a few things. Thank you, John Howard. That was terrific. Uh, and thank you, Andrew, and welcome to CIS. Thank that you. was wonderful. Um, we've been treated tonight uh, to a few wonderful remarks but also reminders of some wonderful political maxims um, Winston Churchill in victory magnanimity uh, that is you don't rub uh, the nose of your defeated foe in the dirt after you've won and John Howard reminded us that even though he was knifed by some traitors in 1989 uh, when he became Prime Minister after a massive landslide election victory over Paul Keating, he still promoted to the Cabinet at least two of those traitors. Uh, you know, that, that takes something. Uh, that doesn't happen a lot in politics, although you did remind us that John Major did that for Michael Heseltine, which is why 
Margaret Thatcher was upset, but also Nelson Mandela as well. The fact oh, that he, he could reach out to prime his example, yeah. enemies. Extraordinary. I mean, that, that is a very rare attribute in politics, to be able to reach out to those who knifed you and danced on your grave. You know, so I thought that was a great line. One of your other lines you reminded us of is another British Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, a Labor Prime Minister, that a week's a long time in politics. And if a week is a long time in politics, a, a year is an eternity. And uh, we mentioned the voice to Parliament. A year ago exactly, the Prime Minister, fresh from his election victory with 32.6% of the primary vote, <laughs> he went to Gama, as he is this week in Gama, the Aboriginal Festival. And he said that um, if the voice to Parliament proposes something should be done, it would be, quote, a very brave government to say it shouldn't be done, which raised all sorts of questions about what it is that runs the country. Is it the democratically elected members of Parliament or is it this unelected, unaccountable body called the voice? And the point here is that a year ago, all the available public opinion polling showed the voice was overwhelmingly popular. But a year later, as we saw on Monday in the news poll published by The Australian, it is in serious freefall. So again, it's a reminder that circumstances can change very quickly uh, in politics. Um, uh, and, and also we were reminded tonight about the importance of stability in policy making and in governance. I think that was a great point you raised, Andrew, about uh, this is not just the John Howard Prime Ministership, as important as that was. It's also the Howard government. And we were really blessed during that near 12-year period to have not just the one Prime Minister, but the one Treasurer and the one Foreign Minister throughout that whole 12-year period. And also some other very prominent uh, ministers such as Philip Ruddick, who I think was also a cabinet minister oh, the entire he was time. A very good very Attorney General and immigration, immigration minister. minister. And you mentioned John Anderson and the other the very sound National Party leaders with whom you formed a coalition. Um, finally, I just want to make the point that on The Voice, um, we are at CIS in the process of organising a series of events in Perth, Adelaide, uh, Hobart, Brisbane, on The Voice. Um, we did a big event here in April, uh, an Oxford-style debate that you can find on YouTube, three of, two affirmative versus two negative. Uh, Jacinta Price and Warren Mundine, who have long been associated with CIS, debating Shireen Morris and Anthony McAvoy on the Yes side. That was a great event. We've got about 50,000 views on YouTube. We hope to replicate that, and we will replicate that uh, in those other cities that I mentioned. Uh, so if you're in um, any of those towns uh, during the course of the next uh, uh, a few weeks, please uh, look at our website and please come along because we'd love to see you. This is a very important constitutional issue that we're facing and that we should be voting on probably in October. Um, finally, next event, it's next week. It's Thursday night. It's our annual keynote lecture. It's called the John Benithan Lecture, named after the inaugural chairman of our board, John Benithan. And uh, it's uh, a, a wonderful event. It's Jason Riley, uh, who's exactly my age. He's 51 years of age. He's a, a leading columnist at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, he's also a uh, prominent scholar at the Manhattan Institute, which is like a sister think tank of CIS. And he's also the biographer of the great Thomas Sowell, who gave our keynote address in 1988. I think you were there that day when uh, Thomas Sowell spoke at CIS. Um, Jason Riley, not to be missed, he's a rising star in um, American conservative circles. And uh, he'll also be speaking here on the Monday afterwards, so Monday week. Uh, he and I will have a discussion with his wife, Naomi Schaefer Riley, another distinguished scholar of American politics, talking about the 2024 election campaign. So that's coming up. If you're not a member, please think about becoming a member of CIS. We couldn't survive without your support, and we hope to see you next time. Now, in the meantime, we've got at least 20, 30 minutes to sign books, drink, mingle, and be merry. Thanks so much for coming. Hope to see you next time.